everybody. How are we doing today? Did we get through the wind yesterday? Uh, just one quick announcement. Next week, Scott Mathis, the president of the Breen Fellowship, is going to be here and giving a message. So please plan on, on being here for that. Invite your friends, your neighbors. If, I'm sure most of you probably heard Scott Mathis preach. If you haven't, you're in for a good ride. He's one of the best speakers and communicators, and, and his passion for the gospel comes out very present in his preaching. So please be here next week for, to see him, and, and we'll have a fellowship dinner and get some time to spend with him and, and enjoy his company as well. Let's go ahead and start, because we are behind schedule today. It's kind of the theme for today is, is behind schedule, and that's okay. Uh, but we're going to pray and start our worship service. Father, we love you so much. We thank you so much for, for who you are, for how great you are, for how powerful you are. It, it's amazing when we consider our, our own strength in comparison to yours. You are, you are so much bigger and stronger, so much more powerful. It's amazing we could get anything done at all. We know that everything we do is in your power, and, and that's amazing. Father, be with us today as we worship you. Father, help us to focus on you, to glorify you, focus on nothing else but you this morning. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Welcome, everybody, this morning. Good to see you this morning. Uh, the verses I'd like to read as we start this morning. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. I invite you to stand with us as we sing Ancient of Days.
missed you. I haven't been here for a couple of weeks, so I really miss seeing y'all. Great worship songs this morning. Oh, uh, he's still on the throne. <laughs> so, our worship reading this morning is 1 Peter 4, 10 through 11. As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as God steward, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterance of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Oh, Father God, thank you for this day. We're just one day closer to you. And Lord, thank you for this word this morning. For the gift of speaking and being able to witness to people about you, we just give you the glory for that. And Lord, we just thank you for today. And Lord, as we ask the ushers to come forward, may we give back a token of what you've given us. And Lord, we, like I said, we give you the praise and glory today in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, church. Good morning, good morning. Had a, a thought come to my mind as we started with Ancient of Days, which is a fun song. Quick song, right? It's kind of upbeat a little bit. Our church that Karen and I met at growing up, there was a lady, and this fits in well with the service today, the sermon today, uh, who she felt like she couldn't do anything in the church, but she knew sign language. So every Sunday morning, she would get up and stand on the side of the, the, the platform of our church, and she would sign the songs. And, and, and just on the off chance, we had somebody who was deaf in our service. We didn't, nobody came who was ever deaf. I don't know if we ever had a deaf person in our church. But every Sunday, she faithfully served by standing up here and signing. And my favorite song of hers to sign was Ancient of Days because it goes so fast. It looked like she was dancing, like she needed to sit down after this song. <laughs> It's just a fun reminder of, of, of service in the church, and we're going to talk about service today. In elementary school, 
in middle school, in high school, and even a little bit in college, I struggled with reading comprehension. My teachers could, could sit me down and give me a, a, a small 10-page book and have me read it out loud to them, ask me questions right afterwards, right as I was done reading it, and I couldn't answer their questions. I always struggled to read books when I was in school because I simply couldn't figure out what was going on in the story as I read the story. As you can imagine, this didn't bode well for my schoolwork, specifically with my English and my language arts classes. That is until I started studying something that I was extremely passionate about, interested during seminary. I learned how to overcome my struggles with reading and comprehension. But I still struggle to this day even a little bit. Karen reads books to the kids every single night, and she's in the middle of a chapter book. And I can sit there with the kids, cuddling with them, listening to her story, and I don't have a clue what's going on. I don't have the slightest clue. She's been reading this book for almost a year now. I don't have a clue what's going on. I can't understand the words that she's reading. Sometimes I feel like the disciples also struggle with the same type of thing when we read, that, we read about their, their reactions to Jesus' teachings. Sometimes I feel like the, the disciples would listen to Jesus when he talks, but they just couldn't make sense of what he was saying. They couldn't understand the words that, that he was communicating to them. And the passage that we're going to read today starts off with Luke, our author, telling us that Jesus was trying to correct the disciples' wrong understanding of the kingdom of God. You know, Jesus started talking about the kingdom of God all the way back in chapter 8. And it's been a consistent theme ever since. And, and the, the parable of the, the, the farmer scattering the seed among the footpath and, and the thistles and the rocks and, and then the good soil, that's when the, the kingdom of God was introduced by Jesus back in chapter 8. And for us, that was June 28th of last year that we started talking about this. So for the last year almost, we've been talking about this theme of the kingdom of God. So they've been hearing about it. They've been listening to it, the, the teachings of the kingdom of God, for well over a year now, and they still couldn't understand or they had the wrong idea of what it was all about. The parable that we're going to read today is, is the last teaching of Jesus outside of Jerusalem. So this is it. This is his, his, his capstone of his ministry before he enters Jerusalem. Starting from the second half of chapter 19 to the end of the book, Jesus is in Jerusalem and he's there to accomplish his goal of laying down his life for the sins of the human race and then coming back to life to finish the job. Last week we looked at at Jesus entering Jericho. We saw that he came with a crowd, which wasn't unusual for him. He was typically followed by a large crowd. And then he found that wee little man, Zacchaeus, who was sitting up in a tree because he wanted to see Jesus. Remember, I shared that, that we need to do all that we can to see Jesus. We need to be like Zacchaeus to put ourselves in a position to see Jesus. Because Jesus is out there looking for us. He's out there looking for the lost, seeking the lost. Jesus is a savior for everyone. But because Zacchaeus did what he could to see Jesus, Jesus radically transformed his life. The man who, who was a notorious sinner, a chief tax collector, a thief, a cheater was transformed when salvation came into his home that day. Isn't that great? If you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, then I want you to know that he's seeking you out. And he wants to save you from eternal death, eternal pain and separation from God. It doesn't matter what you've done in the past. It doesn't matter what you're doing now. The best thing about Jesus seeking you is that he wants you to, to find him. He wants to find you before you ever clean up your act. He doesn't care. Zacchaeus didn't clean himself up first. And yet Jesus still wanted to go with him 
to spend time with him in his house. That was the lesson we learned last week. Do all that you could see, all you could do to see Jesus. We're going to pray, and we're going to dive into our passage today. We're going to learn about servanthood. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the lessons that we have from your word that that teach us how to seek you and, and why it's important to seek you because you love us so much that you're seeking us. Father, we thank you for this lesson that we're going to learn today about serving you and the importance of serving you as a response to you seeking us. Help us to have understanding. Help us to be focused on your word this morning. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. I need to grab another cough drop. So today we're going to be going to Luke chapter 19. So if you haven't already, grab your Bible, turn them on if it's electronic, and turn to Luke chapter 19. And I said this a little bit ago, but, but Jesus and his crew are still in Jericho, and, and this is the last bit of writing that we get from Luke before he enters Jerusalem for the final time. So this is his final parable. And it's almost like he's trying to, to wrap up everything he's been teaching the last year or so with this parable. So we're going to start in verse 11 today. Luke 19, verse 11 says, The crowd was listening to everything Jesus said. And because he was nearing Jerusalem, he told them a story to correct their impression that the kingdom of God would begin right away. So we're told right away that that the crowd was listening to everything Jesus was saying. They had just heard uh, Jesus say, in, in verses 9 and 10, salvation has come into this home today. For this man shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. They heard this. They heard Zacchaeus' story here. But they made two huge mistakes in their understanding of what Jesus meant by this sentence. The first thing that they mistaked was that they all forgot that they were on their way to Jerusalem. Jesus has told them about the plan several times leading up to this point. He had mentioned his death. He, he said that, that it must happen first before anything else. And they still didn't understand what needed to happen. The second mistake they made is that, is that all this talk about salvation coming to Zacchaeus' home today, it had them thinking that the kingdom of God would, would be here right away. Many of Jesus' followers, and, uh, including his apostles, his disciples, thought that, that Jesus was about to, to set up the kingdom of God here on earth right away. They were ready to skip the cross, skip the resurrection, and go straight to the kingdom. But that's not how Jesus said it's going to work. There is no kingdom unless there's first the cross. And that's why Jesus tells them this parable. He's trying to help them comprehend what he's been teaching them all along. So read verse 12 with me. He said, A nobleman was called away to a distant empire to be crowned king and then return. Before he left, he called together ten of his servants and divided among them ten pounds of silver, saying, Invest this for me while I'm gone. But his people hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want him to be our king. Okay, so this parable has three sets of characters in it. The first one that we're introduced to is a nobleman. And this nobleman who is someone who goes to this faraway country to receive for himself a kingdom, and then he plans to return. And this nobleman represents Jesus. And Jesus is, is telling those who are, are listening to him here that he's going to go away for a bit. There's going to be a time when he's not with them. And once he reaches Jerusalem, he's going to go to this distant kingdom, which is heaven, for a while. And, and when he returns, not, not if, but when he returns, he will be crowned king. 
This is what Jesus is trying to get across to the people who are listening to him here. Then we have the ten servants. And, and the ten servants represent the followers or the disciples of Jesus. Those who are believers, people like you and me, if we are believers, we are part of this group of the ten servants. And before the nobleman left for his distant kingdom, he called together the servants and divided among them ten pounds of silver. In the original language, uh, the word that is used there is minas. And in a footnote of your Bible, it will probably tell you that, that one mina equals about three months' worth of wage. So ten minas was about two and a half years, 30 months worth of wage. That's a lot of money, right? And they were given this money with a specific commission. The nobleman said, invest this for me while I'm gone. In other words, the, the servants were supposed to be good stewards of the nobleman and continue serving him until he returns. And do you see the connection here that, that Luke has in his book? You see how this, this accurate account that he's given to us builds on itself. We, we, we talked about stewardship just a few chapters ago and the importance of being good stewards of God. And, and now Jesus is kind of summarizing all of his teachings together. And he's saying, you guys, you servants, need to be good stewards of what the nobleman has given you while he's gone. This is an important reminder that Scripture is not meant to be taking a verse here and a verse over there and, and, and one more verse over here and then try to piece together your own meaning. We're supposed to read Scripture as a full, one body of work. So finally, there's this third group, and they are the His People group. Other translations say citizens here. And, and, and these, these, his people, these citizens, they hated the nobleman. They didn't want to be under his rule anymore. So these people, or, or these citizens, these, these people represent the lost. Those who reject Christ as, as Savior and Lord. In their sin, they attempt to remain their own lords, in a sense. And this is a sad reality in our world today, there will be some who never accept Jesus as Savior and Lord. Scripture makes that really clear over and over again, that this idea that, that some, actually a, a lot of people, will reject Jesus and choose to be lost. And we're going to see their fate coming up at the end of this, this passage here. But for now, let's jump back into verse 15. After he was crowned king... He returned and called in his servants to whom he had given the money. He wanted to find out what their profits were. So verse 15 jumps forward in, in time a little bit. When the nobleman returns from that far country where he had received the authority of the king. And Jesus here is looking into the future. He, he's talking about his second coming. Not, not the time when he's going to come as a savior, but the time when he's going to return as our king. So despite the citizen's protest, the nobleman does, in fact, return with his kingdom in place. And despite what the world says and what the world wants today, Jesus will return. And when he returns, he will set up his kingdom. It will be in place. That should bring us some comfort today, right? That, that as the world continues to swirl down and, and get deeper and deeper into despair, as, as our lives seem to be getting harder and harder as the days go on, as it's harder to follow the Christian values and morals that we have set upon ourselves based off of Scripture, when it seems like all hope is lost for our, our community and our country and our world, we can find peace. And we can't find comfort in the fact that, that Jesus will return as king in charge with all power and all authority. That's something to praise God for this morning, amen? So 
So the nobleman returns with the authority to be king. And the first thing that he does is he calls his servants in to, to give an account of, of how they conducted his business in his absence. And this parable perfectly illustrates 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17, which says, For the time has come for judgment, and it must begin with God's household. Notice that, that both in this parable and in 1 Peter, the first people called before King Jesus are those who follow him. And we will be expected to give an account for what we do with our minas, which is a symbol for our lives. We will be called to give an example, give an account of our lives before Jesus. We will be held accountable for the ways that we've stewarded all that we have been given to complete the commission that we've been given, which is to share the gospel to forward the kingdom of God, right? So I need to ask the question, church, how are you stewarding what God has given you? Are you fulfilling your duty to share God's love and the gospel with the lost around us? Because Christ will one day ask for an account of how we handled his business in his absence. We need to make sure that we're being good stewards. Let's continue to read the accounts that these men gave. Verse 16. The first servant reported, Master, I have invested your money and have made ten times the original amount. Well done. The king exclaimed, you are a good servant. You have been faithful with the little I have entrusted you, so, I will, so you will be governor over ten cities as your reward. The next servant reported, Master, I have invested your money and have made five times the original amount. Well done, said the king. The king said, you will be governor over five cities. Now, there's an assumption I'm going to make here. Since there were 10 servants and, and 10 pounds of silver, 10 minas, I'm going to assume that each servant received one minas a, a, a piece. They could have been split differently. Scripture doesn't say either way. So I, I'm not too concerned with that. It's just kind of the assumption to make my math easier. <laughs> but what we do know is that Jesus shared a report from three of the 10 servants in this parable. The first servant turned one mina into ten minas, ten times the amount of the original value he received. So he was rewarded as, uh, and placed as governor over ten cities. The second one turned his one mina into five minas, which is five times the original value he received. So similarly, his reward was to be placed as governor over five cities. And then we get to another servant. In verse 20. Let's read about him. But the third servant brought back only the original amount of money and said, Master, I hid your money to keep it safe. I was afraid because you are a hard man to deal with, taking what isn't yours and harvesting crops you didn't plant. This servant comes back to the king, to the nobleman, with only excuses. He didn't invest the money. Instead, he, he put it in a safe location and hid it. Other translations here that kind of expand on that idea, and they say that he put it in a handkerchief and he buried it because he was afraid of the nobleman. He thought he was too hard. He thought his excuses might be enough to justify his failure to use what the nobleman had given him. But look at the, the response in the next few verses. You wicked servant, the king roared. Your own words condemn you. If you knew that I am a hard man who takes what isn't mine and harvests crops that I didn't plant, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least you could have gotten some interest on it. What did the, the nobleman say to the two servants who gave their report of, of good stewardship. 
He said, well done. Well done, my good servant, my good and faithful servant. That's not the response that that third servant received, was it? The third guy had proven himself unworthy of the opportunity to serve the nobleman and received a rather scathing review. You wicked servant. And the problem is the third servant didn't act on what he already knew about the king because the king used his own words against him, right? He basically said, if you knew all these things about me, then you should have used what I gave you to make more. You knew I expected something, so why didn't you at least open up a savings account and get your 0.023% interest on what I gave you? Again, those of us who are Christ followers, we will be expected by God to use what he's given us to advance his kingdom. We are to be good and faithful servants, good and faithful stewards of what God has given us. God expects us to use what we know about him to, to motivate our actions. We should act on what we know about God because there's, there's no acceptable excuse for not acting on the truth of what we know about God. This is what Jesus is trying to say here with this passage. We've all seen Jesus. If we are believers, we have seen Jesus. He has saved us. He has transformed our lives. We are now in a right relationship with God because of Jesus. We come to church on Sundays and we learn. We, we study our Bibles at home throughout the week. We are constantly learning more and more about God every single day. We should be. But we are learning more and more about God every single day. And that should drive us to act on what we know about God. And we know that God wants us to further his kingdom, to share the gospel, to reach the lost with the love of God. We know this. That should form our actions every day. Someone once said, I'm not troubled by the parts of the Bible I don't understand. I'm troubled by the parts that I do understand. That person knew some things in Scripture were very clear to him, right? We all know some things about Scripture. The things that we know about Scripture should, will, will make us accountable to God. Whatever truth we know about God, we are responsible for that truth before God. Even if we, just like that, that third servant, didn't care for that truth or, or, or it seemed unpleasant to him to go out and do something about it, we must steward it by acting on it to, to make profit for the kingdom, to advance that gospel. So instead of inheriting the cities to rule, the third servant loses his cities and he loses the stewardship of what God had given him. He himself is not lost. Don't, don't think of that. He is a servant, which was, we de would describe that as a, a believer, someone who believes and has been saved and transformed by Christ. He himself is not lost. He is still counted as a servant of the nobleman, but all that he could have had as a reward in the new kingdom has been taken away. And this is an important concept to understand. Your salvation in Jesus Christ is not hanging in the balance of your stewardship of what God has given you. You cannot work your way into heaven. Works do not equal faith. And you also can't lazy your way out of heaven. You will be held accountable for your actions while you're standing in front of God, you're, while you're giving him a report and you will see all of those times when you weren't a good steward of what God has given you. But when God sees that, that's when his love and his grace comes in and says, you are forgiven because you believe in my son, Jesus. Live for the reward of heaven, folks. 
live for the promise of glory. We should all be serving Jesus. We should serve Jesus with the goal of, of hearing the words, well done, my good and faithful servant. Let's finish up chapter, or this passage in, in verse 24. Then turning to the other standing nearby, the king ordered, take the money from the servant and give it to the one who has 10 pounds. But master, they said, he already has 10 pounds. Yes, the king replied. And to those who use well what they are given, even more will be given. But those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. And for those enemies of mine who didn't want me to be their king, bring them in and execute them right here in front of me. The faithfulness is rewarded in God's kingdom. When we are faithful, we will be rewarded in God's kingdom. Each of the servants had one mina. But the one that wasn't faithful, he didn't steward it well. So his share went to the one who had been faithful. The faithful will be rewarded. But what about that third group of people? What about those citizens who opposed the nobleman from the beginning? Those who, who hated him and protested his, his rule when he went to the, the far country? The enemies in verse 27 are, are those people. They're not forgotten about by the nobleman because when the judgment of his servants are complete, the judgment of the haters begin. And what happens to them? They're executed right in front of the king. And some of you might say, wow, that's, that's kind of a violent image for Jesus, right? Right? But he uses this graphic image to, to help us understand how terrible the consequences are for those who choose to reject him. A public execution is violent, yes, but it doesn't even compare to the condemnation that those who reject Jesus will experience in hell. In fact, those who are in hell right now probably wish they could be executed and have it all over with. But because they've rejected an infinite God, they will pay an infinite price as a result. So Jesus is making it very clear at the end of this passage that the severity of the punishment for those who reject him, for those who hate him, those who refuse Jesus' rule over their lives so that they can rule themselves. Their penalty is eternal death. So what? What can we learn from this final passage, final parable before Jesus enters Jerusalem? The truth is, and it's, it's pretty easy for me to see, I hope it's easy for you to see too, but there's no good reason to reject Jesus. Can you think of a good reason to reject Jesus? To reject a God who who loves you and, and gave his son to save you from hell and then to love you forever? I can't. I only see that, that rejection end in my own destruction. And on the other side, there is every reason to believe in Jesus, right? There is every reason in the world to believe in Jesus as your savior to follow him, to serve him as Lord. Faith in Christ ends with eternal life. And, and faithful servitude ends in ruling with Christ and his kingdom forever. So let's be like Zacchaeus. Let's do everything we can to see Jesus. Let's repent of our sins and, and believe in Christ. Let's help others to do the same thing. Let's help them to see Jesus. 
so they can repent and believe in Jesus. Let's also be faithful servants. Let's do everything we can to serve Christ. And let's be faithful to serve Christ with our entire lives. Then we'll receive the glory and the honor as we reign with him forever. There's no better way to live, right? It's pretty simple. Believe in Jesus as your Savior and Lord, and he will be rewarded with eternal life. Let's pray. God, we thank you for today. Father, I thank you for this message of, uh, of making it as clear as we need it to be. Father, as we look forward to the rest of this book, we look forward to your triumphal entry and, and your betrayal, your death, your resurrection, and your eternal hope. I am excited to continue on in this study. But Father, right now, help us to see the importance of being good servants. Help us to see the importance of of serving you, which looks like loving others, serving others, submitting ourselves to your will, being guided by the Spirit every single step of the way. Father, as a song we sang this morning, you are still on your throne. We worship you for that. Your kingdom will one day come. And we look forward to that as well. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. song we're going to sing is like a postscript to Pastor, Pastor's challenge to us this morning, let it be said of us, I just stand. Amen.